Welcome everybody. My name is Paula Price. I'm with the People's Law School and today we are talking about pets and the law in BC. We have two guest speakers with us today. We have Rebecca Bretter and Dave Turner and we'll be introducing them more formally in just a few minutes. As you know, our webinar is about pets and the law in BC. Today you'll be learning about everyday legal issues related to pets. You'll learn about your rights and responsibilities as a pet owner or a pet caregiver. And you'll also learn about what you can do if you have concerns about someone else's pet. Maybe it's a neighbor situation or something that happens out in a public space. What you can expect today, if you've been to one, our, one of our webinars before, um, then you'll know we talk about um, answers to your questions. We have 60 minutes together, so we'll provide answers to your questions. We'll talk about legal information, not advice, and that is information current as of today. So the distinction there between legal information and legal advice is that advice is the law as it applies to your particular set of circumstances. And if that's what you're looking for, then we would invite you to reach out for legal assistance. You're welcome to reach out to one of our speakers. Their contact information is on the screen. We would like to acknowledge that we are grateful to work on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, whose peoples continue to live on and care for these lands. And we invite everyone who has joined us today to consider and reflect on where it is that you are joining us from today. We'd also like to thank our funders, the Department of Justice Canada, the Law Foundation of British Columbia, and the Notary Foundation of British Columbia, whose financial support has made today's webinar possible. And finally, last but not least, we would love to thank and acknowledge our guest speakers. I'm going to start with Dave Turner. Um, Dave is a partner at the law firm of Edwards, Kenny and Bray in Vancouver, British Columbia. He has a civil litigation practice and deals with disputes related to employment law, commercial litigation, and administrative law. He's well-versed in the various dispute resolution forums in the province. Um, he prides himself on obtaining cost-effective cost effective solutions for his clients. And Dave is a return speaker to the People's Law School. He previously spoke at a webinar about neighbor disputes, and we really appreciate Dave's pragmatic, practical, and accessible way of describing and answering questions about the law. And our guests found the same thing, and some of the feedback included that he provided great answers and with our best interests at heart. So welcome back, Dave. It's so great to have you here today. Uh, thank you, Paula. It's good to be back. Wonderful. And we also have Rebecca Bretter joining us here today. Rebecca is a, the founder of Bretter Law, also in Vancouver. She is a leading animal law lawyer, and you will learn more about what that means during today's presentation. She has 33 years of experience in the animal protection movement, and her law practice includes defending dangerous dogs, pet custody disputes, breeder disputes, condominium disputes involving companion animals, and veterinarian uh, malpractice suits. She acts exclusively in matters that can develop the rights and welfare of animals. And Rebecca is a sought after speaker, and she recently delivered a TED Talk where she talks about her passion for the protection of animals and how she cultivated that passion into her career. And it's a wonderful TED Talk. I just watched it today and highly recommend it. Welcome, Rebecca. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. So we are going to turn to the questions that we have prepared for today. And the first question is for you, Rebecca. What are some common everyday legal issues that arise in relation to pets? Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really excited to be here and thank you for, for you for organizing this and to, for the attendees. And I'm, I'm happy to be here with Dave Turner. We go back, way back <laughs> to law school. We actually don't unfortunately work together, but it's really nice to share this panel with you. So thank you. Um, as just to be totally open, I'm an animal lover myself. I do what I do because I love animals. I'm not gonna lie about that. Uh, so the way that I approach my cases is through that lens. You may hear my 
one of my three cats singing in the background or one of or or my dog barking so it's just the way it is when I'm working from home these days uh, so some of the common everyday issues they it's things that you probably think of you know, when you wake up in the morning sometimes if you live in a strata in a condominium you may have a nasty neighbor who just doesn't like pets doesn't like dogs and so the slightest little sound that your dog makes is like the biggest thing. Uh, so condominium strata issues involving animals. Um, dogs, de I defend dogs. So I don't, I'm not the girl for you. Um, if, if a dog has bitten you and you want uh, defense or, or you wanna uh, take that matter against the dog owner. Um, but the everyday issues, a lot of off-leash dog issues that um, sometimes result in attacks and sometimes result in quote unquote attacks because what's attack for one person is certainly not an attack for another. Uh, veterinarian malpractice issues. So you take your animal to a veterinarian and the veterinarian was negligent. Um, pet custody, how can I forget about this? And there are major changes coming in BC right now under the family law legislation. Pet custody has grown so much in my practice, um, over the, especially over the last couple of years, but it's basically who gets the dog or cat upon separation. And it's not always in the context of divorce, actually. It's just, it can be in the context of two people who've lived together, um, even married legally or not married, and then they're fighting over who gets, the, who gets the animal. But yeah, those are some, there's a lot more, but I'm probably close to my limit. Just, by the way, I should... Paula, please just step in and tell me, okay, time is up. <laughs> I love it, Rebecca. Let me just, okay, one more thing, one more thing, one, one quick thing, is that I was talking about companion animals, and I really, I, that, I know that's what, what the question is as well, but there are also everyday issues, especially in this beautiful area that we live in involving wildlife, like bears coming into residential neighborhoods or cougars and things like that. So it's really... Animals are both companion animals, farmed animals, and wildlife are such a huge part of our everyday lives, even though we may not always realize it. Beautiful. That is perfect, Rebecca. And thank you so much for setting the stage. We've got questions, as you know, that dive into some of these issues more specifically, but very much appreciate you setting the groundwork and just showing the breadth of how pets and the law can interact with each other. Um, this next question is for you, Dave. It's a bit of a fact scenario. I'm having a party at my house. My sister wants to bring her dog, but I'm worried because there will be a number of small children at the party and I've seen her dog get pretty worked up around kids. What should I do? So I'll, I'll just do a quick, a quick thing about myself like Rebecca did. Um, hey. You know how they always set up these panels where they've got one perspective on one and the opposite perspective on the other side? Well, I'm glad to say that this is not the case with this panel. I'm also a dog lover. Um, and um, I think Rebecca and I will probably share some bias towards um, that viewpoint. We'll give full answers for everything, of course, but you may you may hear that as well. Uh, and I was going to say, I think Paul introduced Rebecca as one of a leading animal rights lawyers in the in the city, but uh, she is the leading lawyer. So you're very lucky to have her on the uh, on the panel today. And I will I will do my best on on my questions. Um, this this issue of the party at the house and your, your sister wants to bring her dog with her but I'm worried because you will be a number of small children at the party and these last words are key and I've seen her dog get pretty worked up around kids that is what you really have to focus on is your your knowledge of what of your knowledge of this dog and um I, I won't get into the law too much but there's a number of different ways that you know, if there is a bite at this party and one of the kids does get bitten, that the person that got bit could sue you for. Um, one has to do with whether you're an owner. And so that's not the situation here. We'll deal with that later called C enter. Another one's negligence, but, and the other one is occupier's liability act. And the last two sort of go together. And I think that's the most important thing I can tell people today is that just because it's not your dog, um, your, it's your sister's dog, but it's at your house for this party, you can be held liable for it. If if you have knowledge that this dog, you know, gets pretty worked up around kids, uh, the extreme example is if you've seen the dog bite kids before, um, 
or you know what does that mean to get worked up maybe this means run away or something a little bit softer but you already have some knowledge that um, this could be a problem uh, you can be sued for it just because you've allowed that dog to be at your property when you've been invited all these well you invited the dog and the kids over so you can be you can be liable for that um, uh, in, in a nutshell the occupier's liability act gives you this duty to people who are in your house and um, if you bring a, you know, an animal in and they'll say it's a dangerous animal, if it bit somebody, um, then you can be held liable for that. And the dangers of that can be extreme. If, if, if uh, somehow this person who got bit loses some ability to work, they will be, the personal injury lawyers will be going after you for, for lots of money. Um, and this will be, there's a few themes of my questions but I'll start this question now is one of the ways to protect yourself from these kind of claims. You can't stop them from happening. Maybe other, I'm sorry. If you don't have the dog, then I guess you can stop them from happening. But a way to protect yourself is getting insurance for these things and your standard homeowner's insurance and your standard tenant's insurance, usually, and check your policy, but usually it comes with uh, liability insurance. And a part of that will be personal liability if you get sued for pretty much anything you, no, I shouldn't say anything, but outside of the home. But the other one that's usually in there is premises, liability attaches to your premises. So if this happens on your premises and someone sues you for the act of this dog, even if it's not your dog, um, you still can have insurance coverage for that. But you should you know, make sure that when you're buying insurance that you tell your insurance broker, yeah, I have a dog. And they might ask what kind of dog it is. Um, but if they know that you get the insurance, you should be protected for that. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Dave. It's such a helpful, practical answer. Much appreciated. And um, this next question goes to you, Rebecca. And you alluded to this before. My common law partner and I have a dog that we bought together a few years ago. What happens if my partner and I split up? Very good question. And I'm going to give a very classic lawyer answer for a lot of these questions, which it depends. <laughs> it depends on the circumstances. But what I, I couldn't, and it depends what you really, ultimately it depends what you want to get out of it. Some people, as much as they love their dog or cat, just don't want to have anything to do with their ex anymore. And they're going to, they'd rather for their mental, for their mental health, they'd rather not have their, their dog or cat with them anymore um, and give their, their dog to, or, or companion animal to, to their ex. What I would say is that if you split up um, and it's amicable, then, and this is how I often get involved in these disputes, is that thing, a couple split up, things are good, um, the, they share the dog back, and when I say dog, it, it really applies to cats or any companion animal, really. Um, they share the dog for a year or two until the ex, or for a shorter time until the ex finds another partner, and then the initial partner gets jealous um, and then and then doesn't give the dog back and then something goes wrong. More often than not, people don't think about uh, at the time of split up or especially at the time of getting the animal, they don't think of writing an agreement about what happens when they separate. So let me just back up for a moment and say that if you're in a relationship um, and, and you get a companion animal, and I think we're going to start seeing this more and more, is as awkward as it may be, I would say that try and get a written agreement about who does the animal belong to and what happens to the animal upon separation. Because really right now, the law, we all know animals are considered property. But I could say uh, that British Columbia takes a slightly different approach. Uh, even there are new changes coming to the law soon, like actual legislation. Um, but even up until that comes in, courts have considered, and more in the small claims, courts have considered the best interest of the animal. And, and I think that's key. I always fight for that. And I think that's what we're going to see in these upcoming uh, changes to the law. But um, so if you split up, what really matters is how you behave, regardless even of what the agreement says. It's how the couple behaves in the sense of not behaves, oh, I'm such a nice person, but how the couple is towards their obligations towards the animal and keep track of that. The best thing I could tell you is keep track of who does what 
and the expenses, because those always come into play if there is a dispute either at the tribunal level or court. So even if you don't have an agreement, just keep track the best that you can um, over the, uh, the length of time that the other partner had the animal for, if there are any concerns that you have with the way they treat the animal. And I'll just say one quick note about that, which is that some of us think that we're the best owners or guardians for our animals, right? And if we split up that our ex, yeah, they don't really care as much or they're not as good as we are, that will only take you so far in the court of law. Because unless there's actual evidence, not just allegations, but evidence of animal cruelty and abuse, just because someone lives in a bigger house and on a bigger acreage does not necessarily mean that they're a better guardian than someone who lives in a condo and, and vice versa. So I think in a nutshell, I would say that um, the best thing that you could do is keep track of, of what I put my timer on <laughs> to kind of keep track of myself. But the best thing you could really do is keep track of who pays, how long each person has a dog for so that you could argue that the dog is either really yours or that there was an agreement and the other person breached the agreement. So then it becomes a contractual breach of contract. Idea. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, our next question is for you, Date. Oh, sorry, for you, Rebecca, um, another one. So we talked about the separation. This is another one of the common situations. So my mother has three cats, which I expect will outlive her. What happens to the cats when she dies? That's a really good question um, and a practical question. If the person does not have a will or um, some kind, or at the very least some kind of written explanation about what happens to their animal upon their death. Uh, practically what will happen is the SPCA will likely get involved or an organization like RAPS, Regional Animal Protection Society out in Richmond. Um, and they may take the animal and, and hopefully try to adopt the animal out. I think the best thing that you could do for an animal is make provisions in your will for them. Now, that said, laws here in Canada and British Columbia specifically are quite different than they are in the United States. So if you're reading online about how you could leave gifts for your pet or money for your pet, uh, the, many states in the United States have legislation that allows the direct giving or leaving of money to your companion animal. We don't have that here, not yet anyway. So what really needs to be done is that there, there has to be uh, someone named in the will who's essentially responsible for taking care of the animal or and the expenses for the animal. And then you leave money to the guardian. It has to be worded in such a way that it's tricky because it has to be worded in a way that you're not leaving money for the animal, even though that's really what you're doing. And so um, I, I would highly advise getting uh, a wills and estates lawyer, someone who has experience in this. This area has actually not been litigated and really tested in court. So the wills that I know of and that I've been involved in, more in the background, giving advice to lawyers, uh, we're going to see if they actually uphold or not. But I think that's going to be more common. Uh, going forward, because the reality is, is that fewer people are having kids, they're having companion animals instead. And we're going to be seeing people leaving uh, some provisions or having provisions in their will dedicated for the well being of their animal. Uh, the one of the last things that I want to say is that just be sure that whoever you're, you name to be responsible for the animal is someone you trust. Because just because someone is named as being responsible for taking care of your animal, realistically, doesn't necessarily mean that they'll actually do that. And the reality is, is that, I don't want to sound too grim, but just the reality is that I would say more people won't take as much time and effort to make sure that the provisions of the will are being taken care of properly according to the wishes of the, of the person who made the will. So just be super, super careful about who you actually name in the will to take care of your pet. Beautiful, that's so helpful. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, this next question is for you, Dave. Um, 
My 12-year-old daughter has been walking the neighbor's dog to make some pocket money. Who is responsible for the dog's actions when she's out on her walks? Yeah, and thanks, Paul. So um, I thought the best approach to this would be, imagine you're a personal injury lawyer and you've got a client who's been you know, knocked down or bitten or something, uh, and you want to get money So for your client. So you're basically going to sue everybody. Um, and that means the owners of the dog, and in this case, your 12-year-old daughter. Uh, so, and then there are legal basis to sue all those people. So that scienter, that Latin word I used before, is basically any knowledge of prior bad behavior, the rough translation of it. And it, it applies to the owners of the dog. So, um, so that personal injury lawyer is going to sue the owners of the dog, and they'll go through this whole analysis of whether they knew, you've heard of, probably heard of the one bite rule, whether their owners are in trouble because they knew their dog was dangerous already and you know they, they didn't tell the daughter or something, but they can go after the owners. I think the real focus of this question is, you know, can my dog, can my daughter be liable for it, or can I be liable through my daughter's actions? And um, and the answer is yes, unfortunately. Um, if 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 your daughter was negligent, is the is the word. Um, then yes, yeah, she can be held liable. And, and examples you see over on the internet, uh, various different fact patterns are um, on leash area. Uh, it's outside of your house, outside of your home. But you're out, you're on a walk. On leash area, your daughter lets the dog off leash. It's worse if she knows that the dog is going to rush around and uh, charge people or, or bite people. But dog runs super hard, knocks uh, an old person over, breaks a hip, you can be liable for that. Uh, and I'm so sorry, I say, well, your daughter technically would be liable for that, but your daughter likely lives at your house, will make that assumption, and your homeowner's insurance will cover her if you have that homeowner's insurance I talked about earlier, um, because she's a resident at, at your house. Um, even if she's not on the premises when the accident happens, typical insurance policies will, will cover that kind of accident if she gets sued for uh, something a dog does while she's out walking it. Um, similar to bites though, if the dog runs off and bites another dog um, and the daughter knew that the dog had a tendency to be aggressive <clears throat> or there's some getting back to that issue of not comfortable around dogs or not comfortable around kids, you know there's some issue out there, then yes, um, your daughter can again be held responsible for um, any accidents that happen and, and hopefully again your homeowner's insurance or tenant's insurance will protect you in that case. And I, when I say protect, I do mean not just pay for any claim at the end of the day, but they should pay for your whole, uh, your lawyer to defend you. All those kinds of claims should all be covered by your, by your insurer. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dave. That's really, um, it's helpful. And it's helpful to think about it from the perspective of the plaintiff's lawyer, right? Who, who is going to be in the mix if something were to go wrong. Right. Um, Please. Yes, I, I just wanted to say, because I see these types of scenarios a lot in, in my practice where someone is walking someone else's dog, whether it's a, a kid or, or an adult. Um, but these types of issues also arise a lot in the municipal context. Mm -hmm. So uh, if let's say the dog ends up uh, biting someone or attacking someone or whatever, causing injury to someone else, the dog owner can get a ticket from, at, from the local animal control, even though the dog owner was not the one walking the dog or responsible for the dog in that moment, what often happens is that animal control gets involved and then they issue a ticket to both the dog owner and the person who was walking the dog. And depending on the city, but I'll use Vancouver as an example, it's not just a ticket, it's actually a whole trial process and it's a bylaw offense. So you go through a whole, a whole court process where you plead guilty or not plead guilty. And if you don't plead, guilty, then you go to trial. Uh, but it's not, the only other point I'd like to make is that it's not a criminal offense. You often hear if you do get one of these, um, these notices, it, there's a big uh, title that says offense, and it gives you the option of pleading guilty or not, but it doesn't give you a criminal record. It's kind of similar to getting a, a, a speeding ticket. Oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to pick up on that because that's a really good point too. Um, and the danger, I think why Rebecca raises that, dist distinguishes that between the bylaw offense and the criminal offense is because if there's something that's so bad um, that's happened, that's criminal negligence, 
your insurance company can try to say, oh, well, what you did was so beyond negligent that it was criminally negligent. And then they can try to get out of your insurance policy. So it's a whole other topic and we haven't been asked to do that. But um, I think it is important to show that, you know, that trial process can be important if, in fact, it gets to that level of actually a criminal claim, then you, you risk your insurance coverage as well. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, really helpful. Um, Rebecca, this next question is for you. What do I need to know if I adopt a rescue dog? I can, I've heard that they can require extra care, especially if they have a troubled past. What does that actually mean? Okay, well, let me just say that um, hearing that rescue dogs require extra care or that they're more troubled or just more negative things about rescue dogs, not true. You could have a purebred dog with just as many issues as a rescue dog. And that's because dogs like people have their own personalities. They have their own mental and physical capabilities and just personalities in general. It, so it's not to say that rescue dogs are perfect um, at all, but I just wanted to start off by saying that I think there is a very unhelpful misconception out there that rescue dogs are more trouble. And, and I do think that comes from, I, I don't wanna put down breeders. I have breeders as clients and, and uh, breeders who I know personally and they're wonderful people. Um, but I do think that notion initially came from kind of the breeding industry and usually the really irresponsible and unethical ones that are try trying to sell their product. And so they try to upsell their product by saying, you know, these dogs are perfect. They're purebred. So please don't. And if anything, when it comes to health, like physical health, rescue animals are usually healthier because they're not pure breeds. Pure breeds, uh, different breeds more often than not come with different health issues, whether they're hips, whether they're uh, their nasal uh, problems because of the way that they've been overbred. So I just don't, if you're thinking of getting a dog in your life, please don't think or fall into that trap to think that uh, you'll only have problems. And so part, part of the question is, what does that mean? Like, what does a, 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 a troubled past mean or a troubled dog? And it depends on the context, really. Um, any dog can bite. And as I've learned to defending dogs in the last however many years, is that every dog has a threshold. And so, and what a troubled past to one dog is, it will be very different for another. So the best thing you could do is to get dog trainers who use only positive reinforcement methods, so no shock collars, no prong collars, and get an animal behaviorist involved. And I'll put a shout out to an animal behaviorist I, I often use in my cases. Her name is Dr. Rebecca Ledger. She is not only super qualified in terms of her qualifications, but she's been accepted as a court expert for both sides. So both people who want to, um, who have been bitten or those who want to defend a dog. And she's really reliable. And I highly, highly, suggest that, that you get her or another qualified animal behaviors involved. And a troubled past or a dangerous dog will also be, um, be dependent on the context because various municipal, uh, different cities will define a dangerous dog differently. It could be anything from a dog that has bit or injured another person or animal to, um, to a dog that has a propensity or kind of has a history of doing that. Um, and so there are some municipal laws that actually define what an aggressive dog is or a dangerous dog is. And then there's provincial legislation as well that is very bare bones. And it's usually used only in the context of when a city wants to have a dog put down for being dangerous. Okay, that's really helpful. And, and Rebecca, is there an additional um, responsibility? If you have, you defined a, a dangerous dog, is there an additional responsibility then on a dog owner to take extra care with, with a dog that has that, we'll call it a designation? Yeah, well, if, if the court has made that designation, um, then yes, then you'll have to follow whatever the court says. But if what often comes on, this is a whole, the whole one hour discussion where I'm about to go into, so I'll say it in less than one minute. 
but very often uh, people, get, dog guardians get a letter from animal control where animal control uh, designates a dog as aggressive. And so it's, it's a letter, it says as a result of this incident on whatever date your dog is now considered aggressive and you must follow the bylaws for aggressive dogs. Quite frankly, that you actually don't need to follow that letter. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't, but you don't have to. It's not a court order. A lot of people get this letter and they think it's they have to do that. And the only reason why I say that you don't have to follow that letter is because there's only one case when I was in law school, so before I started getting involved in these, where a judge basically said that it's these letters are just the opinion of an animal control officer. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, this next question is for you, Dave. Um, my dog dug a hole under the fence, entered our neighbor's yard and destroyed their garden. My neighbor accused me of being negligent. What does that mean, legally speaking? Sure. Um, we've touched on negligence a little bit already, but it, at its, its core, uh, you could say it, it's your neighbor's accusing you of, of not taking proper care um, to, to your neighbor, essentially. Um, and, and I don't need to get into sort of at the end of the day, who would win that case? But yeah, if your dog is escaping from your place and you don't take proper care, and every time it gets out, it destroys some property, then eventually your your neighbor could sue um, for, and they would say in their notice of civil claim or their small claims notice of claim saying you were negligent because you let your dog out. You're, every time your dog got out, it destroyed my garden and you kept letting it out. And it took me a thousand dollars to replace the flowers or or whatever the damage is done or you know, um it could be it could range from anything to um i don't know what the extreme damage to property that the dog could do to a garden but it could you know it could be thousands of dollars in some cases mm -hmm. so that that's the risk and and so that's what it means to be to be negative it's just what they will what they will call your actions in a lawsuit if they bring it against you later so it's not something to be sorry. So it's not something to be taken lightly. If they're saying you were negligent, it might mean that they're thinking about suing you for the dog. And if it is keep, if it does keep escaping, you better take some steps to avoid that happening again. Super. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, this next question is for you, Rebecca. I live in a house in a resident. Sorry. Dave, sorry, this question is for you, Dave. I live in a house in a residential area. My neighbor has a new puppy and it barks at all hours of the night. Are they breaking any laws? What options do I have? I don't want to ruin our relationship. The lack of sleep is driving me crazy. Great. Um, so I'll just start off. The way I read this question was in a house in a residential neighborhood. So I'm going to steer clear of strata issues for this because it comes up later. Um, and uh, so we'll just talk like it's it's a residential neighborhood with single family homes in it. Uh, so yeah, we're in we're in Vancouver right now. So we'll use Vancouver as an example. There's noise bylaws that set out you know, noise from and to, to summarize them. Noise from animals must not cause an unreasonable disturbance. Um, you, you know, your options. Um, if if that is happening, so I'll put it out there. They, they, you go to Vancouver's website and they've got an option to um, to make a report. And they say if, if it's anonymous, they're not going to. They'll they'll write it down, but they won't investigate it. But that's kind of an extreme option. So, I'll, I'll, you know, that is out there, and I, I, I wouldn't be a good lawyer if I didn't mention that there is a process there. But um, I, I think what's missing in this question is the, the first thing you should do is contact them. Uh, you know, um, there's probably a, a lot. Of, sorry, the last thing they said was, "I don't want to ruin our relationship." That's exactly what you'll do if you go right to the city and, and start making complaints to the to the bylaw enforcement people. Um, a much better option is going to the neighbors first and saying, um, you know, I, I know it's a puppy, it won't last forever, but is there any way we can resolve this? Because my bedroom is right on the same side of the house that your puppy is being, you know, your puppy's room at nighttime is or whatever. And really try to work with them, you know, it may be as simple as moving the puppy to the other side of the house at nighttime or some way to accommodate this issue because it is a temporary thing. Puppies do bark a lot, um, but it does usually resolve. Um, so the, the first option before contacting the city would be to sue. I'm sorry, it would be to contact them before you even think about suing or contacting the, 
contacting the city. Um, an extreme, I guess eventually you could sue in a cause of action called nuisance. Um, I, I would never recommend that for a puppy barking at night. Um, uh, and what your your damages for losing some sleep would be so minor, the legal fees would cost you way more than it would to uh, ever advance that claim. But it is something that technically is is on the table. But but my but the best option I'd say would be contact the owners first and try to work, work it out. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, Rebecca, this next question is for you. I live next to a sweet elderly woman with a house full of cats. Some of the cats seem to be in very poor health. Do I need to report my concerns to anybody? Yes, and I, I've i seen that uh, similar scenarios personally as well. And the question is really, do I need to report my concerns to anyone? Sadly, I mean, I think sadly, there's no requirement for any person to report abuse or negligence or lack of care or any type of concern. So the law doesn't require you to actually do that. I think it should. The only requirement is if, if you're a veterinarian um, and there is a patient who comes in and the veterinarian is almost absolutely sure that this is as a result of that person abusing and, or neglecting that animal, veterinarians in British Columbia, not everywhere, but in British Columbia specifically, their, their own professional bylaws actually mandate that they have a duty to report abuse or negligence. But assuming you're not a veterinarian and you're a quote unquote regular person like all of us here today, um, sadly you don't have to, but I think that you should, you definitely should. And um, the only entity here in British Columbia that has the power to uh, investigate and to actually charge someone with animal cruelty is the BCSPCA. So you would, you should not need, but you should call the SPCA, uh, the, the BCSPCA, you go on their website and, and uh, they have a, a certain section in there to report cruelty or negligence. And you will need to have as much detail as possible. And it is, it is anonymous, um, but they do need your name. So they're not going to go to the person and say person X called and said that you're you're abusing your cats or being negligent, but they do need as much information because the SPCA cannot do anything about it if they don't know who reported it, who saw it, because if it does go any further, they need to have an actual witness to testify in court that this is what they saw. And it could be tough because if it's a sweet old lady, you know, you, you may feel bad for her. Um, and, but at the same time, I would also think about the poor cats who are being, uh, who are not being cared for and are probably suffering. Suffering doesn't only mean nowadays just a broken leg and walking on a broken leg or paw. It actually, the law has developed in BC and actually across the country to actually also include psychological suffering um, and the lack of mental well being. So I would say that although you don't need to report uh, a situation like this, you definitely should, because after all, the animals do rely on our voices to speak up for them. Super. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, Dave, this next question is for you. And we alluded to this uh, a moment ago, or you did. Uh, I live in a strata townhouse complex. My upstairs neighbors have a very loud dog that runs around and barks at all hours of the day at night. Day and night. I've tried to talk to my neighbors, but they shrug off my concerns and haven't done anything to help with the noise. My next step is to approach the strata. How do I prepare for that? Yeah, uh, thanks, Paula. And I, I think I'm going to take a step back here. And I, I appreciate the question says, my next step is to approach the strata. But I, I would almost, if this problem showed up on my on my doorstep, I'd almost say it's not your next step to approach the strata. You really want to really, really exhaust every effort to work it out with your neighbors first. Um, uh, so there's a number of means to sort of get them to pay attention to you, which we should which we should go through, and including that if you look at your strata bylaws, there, there may be things in there about uh, the type of dog, the size of dog, um, all those things, the, the, the flooring of their place upstairs, 
all those things that might contribute to being a very loud dog that runs around at all hours of the night. Like maybe you're hearing skittering on hardwood floors and, and actually the bylaw says no hardwood floors for exactly these noise reasons. Don't go to the strata with that right away. You, you would maybe, if the neighbors are ignoring you or they're shrugging off your concerns so far, maybe you raise those with the neighbors first to try to get them to pay attention to you so you don't need to go to the strata and start a war with your neighbors. Um, uh, Think about the Strata Council is just a group of members, and some may know these neighbors, some may be um, particularly dog friendly, some may be non dog friendly. But no matter what, you're going to destroy this relationship with your neighbors um, if you go to the Strata right away with um, a series of, of, uh, of attacks on them about various bylaws that you allege that they're, they're breaching. Um, if you do I think I shouldn't say that. Even before that, your goal in these talking to your neighbors, or if you do eventually have to approach the strata, is to be sort of hyper reasonable. You you do not want to get into them with a tit for tat argument about how loud it is or anything. You want to go with a very reasoned approach in writing um, that sets out what your concerns are and, and really shows your attempts to work it out and and give them a little bit of a push too of, of you. They have some motivation to try to resolve this with you personally before you have to go and involve the, the strata council to do it. If you think about, I, I got from the survey, most of the people here are, are dog owners or, or, or pet owners. Um, yeah, I think with me and I'm sure Rebecca too, if somebody came to you and said, by the way, you're not allowed to have your dog here anymore, either lose the dog or move out. Um, you know, the extreme example of what a strata might say, whether they've got authority to do that or not, they, they might say that. Um, they're, you're going to fight like hell to fight that off. You don't want to move and you don't want to get rid of your dog. So it is going to be a war. Uh, and the strata is going to have to get counsel probably to, to fight it eventually. Um, it can go all the way to something called the Civil Resolution Tribunal. And um, it's going to be probably a lot of money for everybody to fight this out. So which eventually goes into the, the fees that you have to pay as a strata owner yourself. Um, so in short, uh, I, I go back to the neighbors uh, first. If that fails, if you're a tenant, talk to you, the owner of your place, see if they can have some more authority to talk to the neighbors and get a little bit more traction there. Um, and then lastly, if you do have to go to the strata, and I, I will eventually actually answer the question that I've been asked to, <laughs> to answer here, is that you want to be, uh, you want to know the bylaws and you really want to evidence the efforts you've made already to try to resolve it. So you, you look extremely reasonable in having to go to the strata at the end. Um, and there's there's case law out there about taking measurements of how loud it is and how frequently the noise is happening and at what time having a record of that. And you, and you can do all that prior to approaching the strata. Um, but I just, I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that the next step is to approach the strata. It's a, the most important thing I can say on that question. Beautiful, so helpful. Thank you, Dave. Much appreciated. Um, and I'll also make a note that on the People's Law School website, we do have resources about how to have difficult conversations with your neighbors. And we have previous uh, webinars about stratas. And so those may also be helpful when it comes to dealing with issues that particularly engage a strata. Um, this next question is for you, Rebecca. And we've got a couple questions and then we've got uh, a window for some live Q&A. Um, I live in a pet friendly community, but my son is very scared of dogs. How do I deal with people who don't respect on leash areas, for example, at parks and on the sidewalk. Who is responsible for keeping public areas safe? And what about inside spaces? And I just know this is a question that came in from uh, one of our guests and I noticed it was in the, the Q&A as well. So thank you for, for responding. Yes, thank you so much for that question. Cause I think that's something that arises in different contexts. It could arise in the context of someone being, having a phobia of dogs in the more extreme cases or, or being very scared of dogs um, or animals in general, or maybe have allergies and they're worried about, um, they're worried about being in a close proximity with other dogs. So I, and, and I'm sorry to hear and I, that someone would have such a fear of dogs because it's a real fear. It's a real phobia, just like any other phobia that someone else may have. I have a close friend, um, in my daughter's school whose daughter is petrified of all animals. She has a phobia. And what the mom has been doing has been working together 
with her child and has gone to therapy and has gone to um, a, a great length to work together with the child to, uh, to try and resolve that fear. And I would start by answering this question, even though it's not really the question, because the question is about who's responsible for keeping the public area safe and inside spaces safe. But I think a very key component to this, and I see it in my own cases, is that sometimes parents unintentionally, certainly not intentionally, but unintentionally feed into this fear with their child because they're trying to do everything they can to protect their child. So if they're walking on a street and there's a dog and they see that their poor child is like, oh, a dog, the, the parent automatically kind of says, oh, okay, it'll, it'll be okay. Um, or, or they, you know, they walk away instead of actually dealing with the fear. And I think that would be a very first important step is to take the matter, not that the person isn't necessarily taking the matter seriously, but to treat it as a mental health issue because it is. Because what I could say is that dogs are here to stay. There are, I mentioned this before, that there, there is only an increasing number of dogs that people will have because people are having fewer kids. And so I think the very first step is to actually deal with the issue as though it's a mental health issue because it is. And then, um, and, and then to get to the actual question about who's responsible in, if you're living in a city, which most people do in an urban environment, it's, there's local, most cities in BC have a local animal control and it's really animal control, not police, not anyone else, but it's the local animal control that is responsible for enforcing bylaws dealing with off-leash dogs. And I can tell you as much as I love dogs, one of the things that just drives me bonkers is when people actually let their off-leash dog in an area that's supposed to be on leash. And then they say, oh, but my dog's friendly, don't worry. Well, I used to, uh, it, it, let alone uh, the people having a phobia of dogs or being scared or they just wanna have the right to not be near dogs. But even dog guardians like myself who love dogs, I have had reactive dogs in my life, not aggressive, but they didn't, if they were on leash, they did not like off-leash dogs coming up to them. And so I feel that my dogs have the right to go for a walk as well in an area without a friendly dog coming up to them. And so your best recourse really, and your only recourse is to call animal control, um, either by dialing, if you're in the city of Vancouver, dialing 311 and making sure that you have a good description of the person and the dog, um, or call the animal control number directly and speak to someone. Um, there aren't many animal control officers in Vancouver. There, are, I, I think I saw someone say that there are two. There are definitely more than two animal control officers in, in Vancouver. There, there are a handful of them. There are about, I think, 10, maybe fewer than 10. But either way, there's more than two, but certainly not enough. That, that I'll, I'll agree with. But that's your best option. Um, and as far as inside spaces, who's responsible? If it's an inside space like a strata, then the strata council has the ultimate responsibility to enforce its own bylaws. If you're in someone's house, it's whoever, it's not necessarily the dog owner, but it's the it's whoever has control and uh, and has the, has the dog in their possession that's responsible. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, we have one last prepared question, then we'll turn to the live Q&A. Um, Dave, this question is for you. I was at a park the other day playing catch with friends and out of the blue, a dog bit me. What rights do I have? Oh, sorry. I had that as um, one of Rebecca's questions. Was that oh, and Rebecca. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I had, I had that as well. Um, oh, <laughs> I was at a park playing catch with friends and out of the blue, a dog bit me. What rights do I have? <laughs> if you were, um, and I have these contexts arise, um, or situations like this arise, and it's almost always um, in the municipal context, like it's city context and animal control gets involved. And so the person who was bit, like my screen just did um, something funny, but hopefully- I've just, I've just put us into a different view for the live. Oh, okay, okay, question. that's, okay, sorry. Okay, so if you were bit, you were playing catch and you were bit, um, well, did you step on the dog's paw when you were playing catch and you weren't paying attention and you didn't see the dog next to you? Even if it's an, even if it's an on-leash area, 
but it was you who was playing catch and you weren't looking at the dog and you know you bumped into the dog then it's i i would say that that's more your fault <laughs> for doing that um for not paying attention where you're going uh and of course that could be argued both ways but it really depends on the context now if you're playing catch in a field in the park and the dog is far away and it's the dog or the dog guardian or owner that lets the dog run across the field and the dog is charging at you and you feel threatened by that then you certainly have um you certainly have a good argument to make that you weren't doing anything wrong but it was the dog owner that let the dog do that so um the basic right that you have is again it is calling animal control that would be the first i i deal with a lot of these types of situations where the starting contact uh, starting point is calling the city officials it's not suing but it's it's calling the city officials and usually animal control depending on the city that you live in now do you have the right to sue like what i tell almost all my clients is anyone could sue anyone for anything and for any reason but it doesn't mean that you actually have the right to do that and certainly doesn't mean that you'll be successful and in these types of dog bite cases what what practically what it often comes down to is it it depends on how bad the damages are because if you're trying to get a couple of bucks and you think you're going to do that you're going to have a hard time finding a lawyer to actually represent you because most personal injury lawyers um, are retained on a contingency basis so they only get paid if they settle or if if you win in court or if they win in court and so um they're all going to take on a case that's worth pennies or dollars i guess pennies don't exist anymore yeah, so your your basic rights are calling animal control, and if it's really really bad, um, then it is suing. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, turning to some of the live questions that came in, um, this is a question from an anonymous at attendee. Could you also talk about pet sitting and the legal responsibilities if something happens to the pet while someone is pet sitting? Sorry, I was coughing. Can you say that again? Yeah. If, so in this case, we've got, um, if you're pet sitting, um, what are the legal responsibilities if something happens to the pet while someone's pet sitting? So we talked about something happens to someone else, but here it's it's the pet itself um, if something happens to to it. Yeah. So if someone, so if someone's taking care of someone else's animal and, and under their care, something goes wrong, Hopefully you're, you're babysitting or pet sitting for a friend and the friend isn't going to do anything about it or they'll be understanding because things happen. And unless you're really careless and irresponsible, then the other person may not even have, like I said, anyone could sue anyone for any reason, but it doesn't mean that they'll be successful. So if, if let's say worst case scenario, a friend sues another friend because their dog died, let's say extreme example, their dog died. But if the person was taking reasonable care, and when I say I'm kind of using a legal term like reasonable, as long as it wasn't, as long as they weren't like hitting the dog and doing put the dog in a in a position where something will will almost obviously happen, chances are there may have been something wrong with the dog to begin with. And and even if there wasn't, the question would or may come down to was the caregiver pet sitter actually being negligent? And there's a whole test for for the law of negligent of negligence. So um, I would say that if you're in a good, if you if you depend on that, if you trust that person, you probably won't get very far. But if it's someone who um, you didn't know, like a first time pet sitter, and they were really reckless, um, and you have pretty strong grounds to believe that, then you do have the right to sue them. On the basis of, I would say just from top of mind, on the basis of negligence or breach of contract, if you yeah. agreed that they would take care of your animal in a reasonable way, you paid for that service, but they didn't uphold their end of the deal. Yeah, if I got into that a little bit more, I agree that um, that these breach of contract cases is sort of more my my area, not exactly the circumstance, but you could do in either case there because um, you've got a it's it's like it's not a written contract often, but just that you're paying someone to 
pets at your dog that establishes a contract, an oral contract. And even if it's not written in there, there's a duty um, sort of implied that there's a duty to take reasonable care of, of whatever you're looking after, in this case, a dog uh, is our example. Um, uh, Rebecca, is there, are there dogs left in hot car cases? I know that's the example that's often used in the media, but are there, are there been cases on that? Yeah, well, there was a really sad case uh, several years ago now, a number of years ago now, where a dog walker left out, it was somewhere in Langley, it was somewhere in Metro Vancouver, and she left, uh, I think it was six dogs or so, in a hot van, yeah. and um, and they died. It was really, really terrible. She tried to use some kind of excuse how she left the air conditioning on and like it malfunctioned or something with that. It was a quick trip. But, you know, the reality is you often hear when, uh, when there's any kind of wrongdoing, let's say even this, is people get the feeling, oh, I'm going to sue that person. And, and that's a completely, I think, natural and normal reaction to have. But if you talk to any lawyer, um, hopefully what they'll tell you is that the litigation process, and, and this is coming from someone who actually litigates and does trial work, for, for animal issues, but it's not easy. It's stressful. It costs money. It's and and money issues aside, it really is stressful. You know, there's that very strong emotion that you want to do justice for your animal. But what people often, and, and this is what I tell my clients, usually in our initial meetings, is that I I'm with them. I agree and I feel that, but we have to think hard on whether you really want to take that next step to sue because even though you may have the right to do that doesn't necessarily mean you should and sometimes you start the process and you have to like go of it which is okay too um but depending on the level of court you have to be aware of, of potential cost implications yeah. thank you thank you so much rebecca and dave um i noticed that we are at one o'clock now um <laughs> I wanted to thank everyone who submitted questions because there are a number of really excellent questions. I'm going, would you have a moment to stay a couple of minutes extra? Um, we're going to do a couple of minutes just to answer this one question and then we're going to wrap up the webinar. We'll close the webinar and leave the line open for a few minutes for anyone who is wanting to copy and paste from the Q&A. But I just wanted to address this one question. Um, what responsibilities do dog rescue organizations in BC have after the adoption if it proves to be an inappropriate fit? Uh, do, do you want me to jump in? If you have an answer, that would be great. And it, um, that would be fabulous. Thank you. Okay, so what rights do, uh, do dog rescue organizations have if they see that it's an inappropriate fit? If it's, or what, what's their obligation? What will they do, I guess? If you adopt a dog, it turns out to be a poor fit, then what will the uh, organization do? Yeah, well, um, I had a case very similar to that. Um, and uh, so I was representing, and you could look it up. It's it's a reported decision, which means that you could, you could look it up on Canly, which is a free legal database. Um, and it's uh, a case of... Uh, Sagu, Sagu versus Murray. And it was several years ago now. Um, and I was acting actually for the rescue organization and the new dog owner. And it was the previous dog owner who was suing my client, the rescue organization. And they were suing because, um, so it's a little bit on, uh, uh, the, the original dog owner was suing the rescue organization because they wanted the dog back, but the dog had already been adopted out. And the rescue organization found that um, they didn't want to give the dog back to the original dog owner because uh, they, it wouldn't have been a good fit anymore. And I realize it's, it's a slightly different scenario because it's not a good fit, but it's still the same principles apply is that it wasn't a good fit and what can you do as a rescue organization? And so what I would say from my experience is that if it really is that bad um, and you can't resolve it, then I would probably take it in the small claims um, jurisdiction court, not Supreme Court, not civil resolution tribunal. And it would probably be on the basis of it's like a pet custody type of dispute. 
And then you have to show that the rescue organization is uh, is the actual owner of the animal. But then, of course, there's a question of if the new person signed um, signed an agreement where the rescue was actually giving them the animal to this new person. But there's always ways around it because obviously the intention behind that agreement was that the person was going to take care of that animal properly and not leave the animal you know, in a neglectful way. And so I would frame it probably in the context of a pet custody type of dispute. Um, yeah, so it was. Super, thank you so much, Rebecca. And thank you so much, Dave. And thank you to everybody who has joined us here today. Rebecca, is there anything that you wanted to add from today's session that we didn't get a chance to cover in the questions that were posed? I think broadly speaking, what I would say is that animal law in Canada and in British Columbia really is evolving. Um, I went into this business really because of a personal passion of mine since I was like, maybe not this little, but <laughs> like 12 years old growing up in Montreal as an as a animal rights activist. And we see so many sad stories in the news. I, I certainly deal with um, a lot of upsetting stories literally every day. Um, and as hard as it may be to see all of these issues, and especially I see that we have a lot of animal lovers online today, coming, please take it from me, um, that as hard as it may be, the law is getting better, slowly, <laughs> slowly, but surely. Um, and, and this really comes from me personally and professionally speaking. There's a long way to go, but when I really went, and Paula, if you, if you saw the, the talk that I gave, um, I, I say this a lot. And, and for me personally, when I have judges in my cases that agree with me that animals are more than just property, that they're sentient beings, that, uh, that they play an important part in our society, it's like, everything I do is, it, it makes everything worth it. So I just wanted to leave on a more positive note that things are getting better for animals um, slowly but surely. And I'm hopeful that there will be more animal lawyers coming into the world um, who will be fighting for, uh, for animals and giving them a voice. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And thank you for the work that you do in relation to animal law. It's, it's really impressive. Well, thank um, you so much for having me. Thank you for coming. And and Dave, how about you? Any any parting yeah, words for today's discussion? Nothing brand new, but I really want to emphasize the real nuts and bolts um, thing, which is this insurance issue. Um, you know, uh, I read somewhere that the average when someone does sue, the average amount of damages now are like thirty five to forty thousand dollars in damage that causing. You know, the, they'll always inflate the damages. That's not what they're going to get at the end, but. Um, but that's a lot of money to a lot of people. So if you are a dog owner um, and you're a tenant or a homeowner, just, you know, I don't think uh, unless something's changed in the last couple of years, uh, tenants insurance is not that expensive. And you can, if, you, if you're not either, um, you, can, you can buy, I understand, specialty insurance just to uh, insure your dog. And uh, yeah, that, I think that will bring you a lot of peace of mind, especially if you have a dog that it maybe is reactive or excitable or something could happen for not that much money a month you can have that peace of mind that protect you and one area of what i do is um a breach of insurance claims if your insurance dreams up some reason to deny your claim don't just take that at face value go see a lawyer about that especially with a lot of money on the line because uh, it it happens more than you, you think so that's how i would i'd leave that Thank you so much, Dave. And as always, appreciate your very practical and solution-focused approach to, to looking at these types of questions. So um, very much appreciate you coming back and joining us for today's webinar. Thank you again, Rebecca. Thank you again, Dave. Thank you to everybody who has joined us here today. Thank you to the People's Law School team. And we look forward to seeing everybody at our next webinar.